commencer. Euh, je fais cette petite introduction en français, mais vous savez, vous avez été prévenu que les deux conférenciers parleront anglais. Euh, pour ce qui est des questions, elles peuvent être posées en anglais ou en français, il n'y a pas de problème. Je fais cette petite introduction en français, euh, parce qu'on est quand même en France et à l'Institut de France. Donc, euh, très rapidement, parce que euh, ce qui nous intéresse, c'est ce que vont nous dire Jamie et Virginie. Très rapidement, le contexte. Donc, ici, vous êtes euh, à l'Institut de France, plus particulièrement sous le parapluie de l'Académie des sciences morales et politiques, dont je suis membre, et encore plus spécifiquement dans le cadre d'un projet de l'Académie ou d'une enquête de l'Académie euh, dont j'ai proposé le thème et que je pilote, hein, une enquête qui aura duré en tout à peu près quatre ans. On est dans la troisième année, euh, dont deux années de Covid, donc ça a été un peu compliqué, mais enfin, on a travaillé quand même. Le projet s'appelle TESACO, qui est un sigle I2 pour technologie émergente et sagesse collective. L'idée de TESACO, c'est qu'on a donc euh, des technologies émergentes des néotechnologies extraordinairement puissantes qui bougent extrêmement vite et qu'il faut dans toute la mesure du possible en garder une maîtrise ou en recouvrer peut-être la maîtrise dans la mesure où on voit qu'on l'a perdu parce que les choses vont beaucoup trop vite, ce qui est un thème qui est, qui est notamment développé par, par Jamie. Voilà, donc ça c'est euh, le cadre général. Euh, il y a aussi le fait que euh, la conférence d'hier de Jamie était co-organisé co par l'Institut Jacques Monod euh, grâce à Virginie Courtier. Donc, c'est une initiative commune de l'Institut Jacques Monod et de l'Académie des sciences morales et politiques. Euh, ça mérite d'être souligné parce que ce n'est pas tous les jours que ces deux univers <rire> communiquent et collaborent. Et j'espère que euh, ça n'est qu'un début, comme on disait en mai 68. Alors, <rire> Une chose qui m'a amusé, je me suis rendu compte en regardant ma bibliothèque qu'il euh, y a très, 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 très longtemps, il y avait déjà un Jamie Metzl qui s'appelait Jeremy Rifkin, qui est, déjà, qui est encore aujourd'hui un futurologue extrêmement connu, euh, sauf qu'il est allé plutôt du côté, je crois, de l'économie, de la globalisation, etc. Mais à l'époque, il s'intéressait à ce qu'on appelait à, à l'époque les, 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 les manipulations génétiques, en anglais « recombinant DNA », et il avait écrit un livre qui est Mutatis Mutandis, un peu comme le livre de Jamie euh, Darwin Hacked, c'est ça Hacking Darwin. Et euh, ce livre s'appelait Who Should Play God Et euh, il a été traduit en français et j'ai, il se trouve, fait l'introduction euh, de, de la traduction qui est parue en 1979. Donc, euh, personnellement, je trouve qu'il y a une espèce de, de continuité inattendue dans euh, le genre d'initiative que je fais, parce que je ne suis pas biologiste euh, professionnellement, je suis mathématicien d'origine et devenu philosophe des sciences. Voilà, ça, c'est ce qui me concerne. Alors, maintenant, je vais tout de suite donner la parole à Jamie d'abord, je crois, et Virginie, c'est dans cet ordre-là. Voilà, donc Jamie, vous avez vu, c'est un auteur, un romancier, un futurologue, euh, auteur donc d'un best-seller qui s'appelle euh, Hacking Darwin et qui a un site magnifique qui vous dira beaucoup de choses sur lui et sur ses activités. Et puis Virginie qui est directrice de recherche au CNRS, au CNRS et qui dirige une équipe euh, de génétique à l'Institut Jacques Monod, université maintenant euh, de Paris, ex Diderot, ex ex-Paris 7. Pour moi, c'était Paris 7, c'est là que j'ai passé mon doctorat il y a très longtemps. Voilà, je donne tout de suite la parole à Jamie qui va parler en anglais. Il n'y a pas de transparent, il y a juste ce transparent-là, donc c'est facile à suivre, c'est vivant, et ce sera, je suis sûr, très intéressant. So, Jamie, uh, the floor is yours if you want to stand there or wherever. Okay. Merci, Daniel. Merci à vous. Je m'excuse de parler anglais. Uh, ma français n'est pas si bien. Alors, uh, uh, vous uh, comprenez anglais? Ça va? OK. <laughs> si uh, je dois parler plus lentement, um, s'il vous plaît, me dire. Thank you so much. All right. So, thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Virginie. Thank you to all of you for, uh, for being here. And I first have to say, I'm just so thrilled to be in Paris. It's such a beautiful city. And on a beautiful day like today, it's easy to feel like the world is in, in a great place. Um, 
But we all know, and the reason why everybody is here in masks is there's a great deal of suffering in, in the world right now. And whatever there's uh, not complete consensus about what is the total number of people who have died from COVID, but I personally think that the economist figure uh, of around 15 million is probably the closest to accurate and much uh, closer to being accurate than the, the four million number. Um, and we know that hundreds of millions, if not billions, uh, of the most vulnerable people in the world have been pushed back into even more abject poverty. And I certainly understand that when we're talking about an issue as sensitive as pandemic origins, um, there's a natural instinct to say, why should we even ask the question? Why should we even ask a question um, that is so sensitive? Because if it should be proven that the pandemic stems from a lab, an accidental lab incident, followed by a criminal cover-up, the implications, including the geopolitical implications, would be so massive that maybe it's better to just not ask the question. Maybe it's better to say, you know, some pots should just not be, should just not be stirred. Um, it's my belief, though, that the reason that we are here, the reason why we need to be fearless, thank you, uh, the reason why we need to be fearless f tracking the origins of the pandemic to the ends of the earth is not to point fingers in any kind of vindictive way. It's because we are entering an era where the frequency of pandemics is increasing because of the, the way that humans are habitating this planet we're entering an era of synthetic biology where it is easy to imagine pandemics far more dangerous and far more deadly than this one. And I personally don't want to be explaining 10 years from now or 20 years from now to people who are asking the question, let's just say there's a pandemic that kills a billion people. And, peop and people say, well, you had this last pandemic you got off relatively easy compared to what you knew was possible. Why weren't you fearless? Why didn't you ask the toughest questions? And so for me, that certainly has been what's animated me in this process. I know uh, that my friends Virginie and Fabienne and others um, feel, uh, feel the same way. It would be much easier to not ask these tough questions because the implications are so massive. But the consequence of not asking, in my view, is far greater than the uncomfortableness of asking. So let me, I just wanted to start by, by saying that. And what I'd like to do in the way I, I tell the story, maybe do it in, in three parts. Um, first, I'll talk about my personal experience of uh, beginning to, to um, draw my own conclusions or develop my own hypotheses, particularly over the course of last year, of 2020, from the, the earliest days. And then to go back and talk a little bit about the geopolitics um, as they have emerged from the, uh, from the beginning, uh, and this, the political maneuverings, including with the WHO. And then in the third part, uh, talk about what I believe are the most important next steps. So let me start in the beginning. In January of last year, um, when I and many of you um, started to hear the stories of this uh, respiratory virus and the, and the outbreak in Wuhan, it sounded familiar because we had had multiple stories of these kinds of outbreaks often but not exclusively coming from China, predominantly southern China. And so if there's another one of these viral outbreaks happening in China, then we could say it, it felt well, and then the story was that it was coming out of a market and we knew uh, the history of SARS and MERS. So it just, it felt well, there's nothing wrong with that story. It feels about right. 
um, even in the earliest days of January 2020, I just had one thing that didn't sit quite right with me. As my friend, comment vous appelez-vous? Oui. Yao Mei. As Yao Mei, uh, who is a graduate of, Yuh of Wuhan University, uh, knows. So I had been uh, invited to give a keynote talk at the University of Wuhan in 2019. Um, there's a whole story that I won't go into now, how I had been given promises that I wouldn't be censored. I was, was, uh, but then the morning of my talk, when they realized that I was about to say something uncomfortable, these men in dark suits came to my guest house and, as Ursula knows, um, informed me that my talk had been canceled. And anyway, there's a whole story. It's on my website if anybody wants to see it. But having spent a decent amount of time in, in Wuhan, I knew that Wuhan was a very sophisticated, um, wealthy, highly educated city. It's China's equivalent of Chicago in the, in the United States. And so when people in the United States were hearing the story of a bat, uh, a bat virus coming out of a Chinese city, most people in their minds were imagining some kind of backwater where a bunch of yokels were eating bats um, for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And I, just having been there, that wasn't my impression of Wuhan. So that was my caution. Um, but it wasn't a huge caution. It was just like, huh, that's interesting. But then in late January 2020, um, I read a paper in The Lancet, which showed pretty clearly um, that more than a third of the earliest cases um, of infection in Wuhan were of people who had no exposure to the Huanan seafood market or to any market. And in my mind, that showed, I mean, it didn't prove it decisively, but it showed pretty clearly that most likely the market was a place um, where the infections were amplified, not where the pandemic began. And then my second very, very big clue um, was that the Chinese government, though, even after that information came out, kept with their same story of it comes from the market. And that was my trigger moment. And as uh, Daniel said a little bit in his, in his int introduction, I have a background both in science and in geopolitics. In science, as Daniel mentioned, I'm author of Hacking Darwin, I'm a member of the World Health Organization, OMS, uh, Advisory uh, Expert Committee on Human Genome Editing, and deeply involved in the science world, although I'm not a, a bench scientist like uh, Virginie. Um, I also uh, live in the world of politics and geopolitics. I'm a former member of the United States National Security Council, the State Department, um, and I work for Joe Biden in the United States Senate and I have a PhD in, in Asian history and lived and worked in, uh, in Asia. And I really feel that one of the reasons why I was in a, maybe a unique position to make the kind of early call uh, of, uh, that I did of raising questions, at very least, is that to open this door um, required two keys. It required the key of science and it required the key of understanding the pathologies of the Chinese Communist Party. Because if you only understood the science, but you didn't understand the pathologies of the Chinese state, you would just um, say, well, here's the information that we have. Here's what this government is saying, like the Swiss government or the Norwegian government. This government is providing information. Um, therefore, we'll draw conclusions based on, on that available information. And if that's what you did, you would have gotten the, it wrong. You wouldn't have been able to see what was happening. Um, but if you only understood the politics, uh, of, and particularly China's internal politics and the priorities of the Communist Party, well, you would say, well, this is, it's not that the Chinese Communist Party lies. It's the foundation of the existence of the entire Chinese Communist Party is based on recreating or creating its own realities. 
And you can see this all the time. If you go to Tiananmen Square, you see the picture of Mao, um, the portrait of Mao that's hanging, even though many people, including many people in China, are well aware uh, that Mao was responsible for the deaths, unnecessary deaths, of some 47 million Chinese people. Um, if you go to, uh, to Beijing and you see these parades, massive military parades, uh, as they recently had, commemorating the victory in World War II, you would think, wow, isn't this great? Uh, the Chinese Communist Party must have fought in World War II, which, by and large, they didn't. As a matter of fact, they were huge beneficiaries of the Japanese beating the, the, nationalist, uh, the nationalist army. Uh, we saw in the, in the first SARS, there was a very aggressive effort to cover things up. And when the first speed train crashed, um, they dug a hole and threw the train in it and covered it up, um, thinking that, that uh, not that nobody would know, but that they could recreate reality. So you had to understand that in order to understand this. But if that was all you understood, you really wouldn't have anything. These two pieces needed to come together. And so when the Chinese government was pushing this story that I knew, that they knew, was almost certainly wrong, that was what really triggered me. And that was when I fully dove in, in the earliest days of last year, late January, um, early February, and started gathering information. Um, and very, very quickly, uh, these questions that I'm sure you're all now familiar with uh, arose. Uh, that it was uh, a virus with a horseshoe bat backbone. Um, and there, we thought at that time um, there were no live horseshoe bats in Wuhan because it's uh, more than 1,000 miles away from the natural migratory range of horseshoe bats. Later, we found out that there were live horseshoe bats in Wuhan being kept at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Um, and we, uh, we knew, and I certainly knew about Wuhan Institute of Virology uh, from before, um, but it was very, very quickly uh, we learned that the Wuhan Institute of Virology, which is one of China's only level four virology institutes, um, has the world's largest collection of bat coronaviruses uh, and was doing very aggressive research. And I, I, I won't go into it. I think Virginie may talk a little more about the technical issue of gain-of-function research. But certainly, um, they were doing, and there's not even a debate, they were doing work <clears throat> to make scary viruses scarier. And we'll, I'll just use the non the non technical uh, the non technical terms for that. And we very very uh, quickly learned uh, that when the virus uh, emerged, it was uh, it was primed to infect humans. As a matter of fact, primed to infect humans to this day, uh, it's a better able to infect human cells uh, than any other animal cells, including bats, pangolins, and, uh, and, and civets. And we know at the Wuhan Institute of Virology um, that they uh, had been exposing these bat coronaviruses to uh, human cells and, the human, and humanized mice, which had basically ACE2 knock-in mice. I think you know the, the spike protein on the virus docks on the ACE2 receptor in our, uh, in our cells. So there was a lot of information that at very, very least was highly relevant. And the more that I and we um, began to dig, there was more and more information that came out. Maybe you're familiar with it. Um, <clears throat> the stories uh, of the miners who had gone into the uh, to the cave in Yunnan province, the Mojang mine, uh, in 2012, where all six of these uh, of these miners had become sick with what looked very much like COVID-19-like symptoms. Three of them had died. Um, their um, blood samples uh, were taken to Wuhan Institute of Virology and, and other places, and then Wuhan Institute of Virology did repeated visits um, to, to collect around 16,000 
viral samples um, from this, uh, this Mojang mine over the, uh, over the years. So the more questions emerged, um, the more data emerged, the more at least my uh, questions grew. At this time, I thought I was on my own. I didn't know there were amazing people like Virginie and, and others scattered, small numbers of people scattered around the world. I, I thought it was just me. And then in February of 2020, um, I and maybe some of you read this letter in The Lancet. And the letter was written by Peter Dazak, who's the head of EcoHealth Alliance, and 26 other scientists, very respectable people. Um, and what the letter said is essentially, we pretty much know uh, this outbreak has a natural origin and that anybody who's suggesting it may be uh, connected to any kind of lab incident, essentially, and this wasn't the exact wording, essentially, is a conspiracy theorist. And it just pissed me off. I mean, I, I had, as I mentioned before, I've experienced censorship when I was in Wuhan. I know what it looks like um, when people are trying to silence other people. And it would be one thing if these scientists had information, if they were presenting any kind of determinative data, um, but they weren't. In that letter and in the, the now infamous uh, Nature Medicine paper from a month later uh, in March, it was, as I've called it, scientific propaganda and thuggery, because the goal was to silence other people. It was not to present information. And it really uh, pissed me off. And in, my, in February of, uh, of 2020, uh, I was in uh, South Africa for the meetings of our uh, World Health Organization, OMS Advisory Committee on Human Genome Editing. And I raised with my, uh, the other members of our, our expert committee, people I tremendously respect, my concerns. And I was kind of hoping that they would say, oh, you're crazy. Um, but I think a lot of people were starting to, to ask questions. Um, and so my, my concern just kept growing. And the more I collected information, um, the more uh, I started to feel that the dominant narrative that we were being fed was wrong. Um, and not that I absolutely knew the answer, but I knew that the people who were telling us that they knew the answer, that it was a natural origin, a zoonosis in the wild, not connected to any kind of lab incident origin, I, I felt that they were bluffing. They were trying to present a certainty that they didn't have, even for good reasons, because it's, it's much more convenient for all of us if it should be a natural origin, it just may not be the case. And by natural origin, I know that it's, it's confusing. Even if there's a lab incident um, origin of the proximal origin of the outbreak, there could be a natural origin, but it's, it's just a, a shorthand uh, that I'm using. And so in March of last year, uh, I, started, uh, I started very, very publicly. And I had been tweeting about this, but I started very publicly speaking out, uh, doing media interviews. And in April, I launched my website on the origins of the, uh, of the pandemic and just started collecting all of the evidence uh, that, I could, uh, that I could find. And I started reaching out uh, to people across the spectrum, to journalists, uh, to editors, to governments uh, and, and others. Um, and it was just, it was kind of a surreal experience. A very close, uh, or a good friend of mine uh, was the, I, I think, the one sane person in the Trump White House, Matt Pottinger, the Deputy National Security Advisor. And we'd known each other for many years, and he's a fluent Mandarin speaker and, and a very smart guy, former Wall Street Journal journalist who really knows China. So I called him and I said, look, um, here's, here's what I think. I don't know the answer, um, but there's a big question. And you know, I'm a, a progressive liberal Democrat, so I despised much of what the Trump administration was doing and saying, and I certainly recognized the racism inherent in what Trump was saying about the virus, the way he was calling it Kung flu and, and all those, those things. Um, but 
the fact that President Trump um, was and is a pathological liar and a racist, um, that couldn't be an absolute barrier to even asking questions about this big issue of the origins of the pandemic. So I called Matt and I said, look, we have to get to the bottom of this. And he was very sympathetic. And he was curious because with everything that, that President Trump was saying about pandemic origins, it turned out there was no structured interagency tasking to get to the bottom of the pandemic origins question. Because I'm former National Security Council, I know what it takes. It's not North Korea where the leader says something and then everybody does it. There needs to be a structured process to translate an order, even from the president, into something that the agencies, including the agencies, do. And, and that didn't happen. And in fact, what happened was Matt Pottinger took my website and he sent it to other people in the United States government saying, hey, we, we need to look into this. He sent it to the media and he sent it to foreign governments saying, hey, there's, there's, there's something here. I mean, it's, I mean, it's flattering for me, but it's kind of tragic uh, that, that the main resource that the US National Security Council is using is my own jamiemetzel.com website, J-A-M-I-E-M-E-T-Z-L.com, just kidding. Um, the, uh, and, um, but that's, that's where things were. Um, and so I started writing more and speaking more. I had a, uh, an editorial in the Wall Street Journal opinion pages last July, um, which was, as far as I know, uh, the first uh, piece in a major international paper that wasn't written by a Trump supporter. Uh, as a matter of fact, I was attacked by a lot of my friends saying, you're supporting Trump's narrative in an election year when it's so obvious uh, that he's trying to deflect blame for the monumental screw up in the United States that is, whatever the origins of the pandemic, however responsible China is, regardless of the origins, for the criminal cover-up that, uh, that has been devastating for the rest of the world, there is no doubt that many large, no, a large number of people certainly measured in, in my view, in the hundreds of thousands, are dead because of the failure, yeah, at least in the United States, because of the, of the monumental failure of the United States government. So it was clear that Trump was doing everything possible to, to deflect blame. Um, but still, there was the question of how did this pandemic uh, begin? And so I was really just pushing for all of, uh, all of last year. Again, thinking that I was kind of uh, on my own, um, but like many people, was finding outlets in, in, in media, in a website, and in social media. And then later in last, uh, last year, I had the pleasure, Virginie uh, reached out to me and told me that she and a small number of uh, French academics had uh, brought together this, this small community of experts that were doing uh, monthly virtual online seminars. So we, it was uh, with a kind of an academic bent. People were presenting papers, presenting uh, data. And so they did a great job of finding, I think Virginie tracked people down uh, all around the world, finding and bringing together uh, people who had the same kinds of, uh, of questions. None of us were saying we knew the answer. Um, but everyone was saying there are big questions that must be asked, uh, and we really uh, and we really need to um, we really need to dig. So let me then go back uh, and talk a little bit about the geopolitics. Um, I talked about my uh, relationship um, with the, the uh, Trump White House. Um, also, um, when I was working in the Senate. Um, uh, Joe Biden, then when was chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. He was my big boss. I was the deputy staff director, and Tony Blinken was the staff director. So this team that's now in the, the U.S. government are, are people I, I know quite, uh, quite well and trust. And so I did have not insignificant interactions um, with uh, people both in the campaign and in the, the transition uh, team. And so I knew that they, they were interested 
in this question. They were open-minded about um, hearing from it, hearing about it. Um, and, but the politics of how this played out, even beyond the United States government, I think were, were very telling and have had a huge impact um, on how, um, how things have, have played out. First, we want, want to talk about the information environment in last, uh, from particularly in last year and why it, it was so, so difficult. And so if I, had, if I had to summarize all of it, what I would say is this. Um, from the earliest days uh, following the outbreak, uh, China began its massive and ongoing cover-up, uh, which involved, but I think everybody knows about this uh, scrubbing social media, um, about um, arresting the, the first whistleblowers, um, but China also destroyed samples, hid records, imprisoned citizen journalists who were for asking the most basic questions. Matter of fact, one of them is near death now, and relatively quickly established a universal gag order preventing Chinese scientists from writing or saying anything about pandemic origins without prior government approval. So the, uh, the crackdown, the cover-up in China began really on day one. It got better. Uh, it was more porous in the beginning and got less porous over time. Because of that, um, there was not enough information and data coming out of China. And because of that, responsible scientists in the world outside of China who are used to drawing conclusions based on data more than based on purely on logical inference didn't have the data that they felt they need, needed to draw these conclusions. Matter of fact, I spoke to a lot of people last year some of the most famous scientists in the world, people you've all heard of, and everybody, many of them, said basically the same thing. They said, I think you're right with the questions you're asking. I quietly support you, but I don't dare speak up. And there's different things of when after why I don't dare speak up, but the summary was, um, I don't want to be called a racist. It would be career suicide. We don't have the data. There were all, the, all these reasons why people didn't speak up. Into that vacuum stepped a small number of high-profile scientists, mostly virologists, many of whom had very significant conflicts of interest, others who had things that wouldn't qualify as conflicts of interest, um, but were just conflicts, let's say. Um, so some of them, uh, most notably Peter Daszak, who had been a funder of the Wuhan Institute of uh, Virology, now, he had a very, very clear and undisclosed conflict of interest uh, because um, the questions about the possibility of a lab incident origin in many ways pointed potentially at him and his organization. And so he had a real conflict of interest. But there were other, uh, and, I, and I, I don't even question the motives of many or even all of these people, there were other people who were respected virologists who knew of the experience of, of SARS-1 um, and the origins of SARS-1, which were kind of this traditional thing of, of um, the virus, a spillover event uh, happens in the market through the, the uh, wildlife, uh, wildlife trade, who had dedicated their careers to this idea of um, collecting and studying viruses. And then the lessons of that is um, we need to stop human, or slow human encroachment into wild spaces, we need to slow climate change, um, we need to build the field of virology. We need to strengthen international partnerships. All of these wonderful things that I think we all um, would support. Um, so those people, I think, recognized that if this was a story, so the story was for our whole life, we've been um, uh, anticipating this. We've been warning about it. And now, and people said this, this is nature fighting back. If we don't listen to nature fighting back, we humans are going to be at risk. It was the culmination moment of so many people's careers and noble careers. Um, I'm not against the field of virology or epidemiology. So there was a real built-in subconscious, probably even, incentive um, for people to see this as, well, we, here's what we've been warning, and here it is, and if you don't, and now's the time where we need to fix these, these problems. And fixing many of these problems 
is a, a good idea. So they stepped in, particularly in, in February and March of last year, projecting a certainty that they could not have possibly had based on the evidence, saying we know it's a natural origin and anyone suggesting a possible lab incident origin is a, is a uh, conspiracy theorist. And so then um, we had President Trump, who I said even if you support President Trump, um, which I do not, um, but even if you did, you would just have to accept that he's a pathological liar. I mean, the, just the number of lies that have been documented in the media are just irrefutable. And because of that, the media, uh, certainly in the United States, had shifted from the earliest days of the Trump administration where the reporting had been what I call he said, she said journalism. Um, President Obama said X, and then you find some expert or some uh, member of Congress or whatever with an opposing view, and then you say, Senator Y said Y. And, um, and that was the way that the media did balancing. But when you have a pathological liar as president, the president would start with an outlandish claim, like Daniel is an ax murderer. And then in the early days, it would be Daniel is an ax murderer, and Ursula says Daniel is not an ax murderer, because that was the he said, she said journalism. Then you'd have three or four days on every news channel, there would be this debate, is Daniel an ax murderer? Maybe Daniel's not an ax murderer. And then three days later, someone would say, why are we having this completely asinine conversation? Because it's based on an absurd lie that started the process. So the media shifted to, here's what President Trump said, here's what the experts say, and here's why what President Trump said is a lie. And it was the right thing for the media to do in most cases. But even a broken, at least analog clock, is right twice a day. And so because this was the habit, and then you had President Trump saying Kung flu, Wuhan virus, China did it, World Health Organization did it, even though he, before he had been praising um, uh, Xi Jinping, the media said, here's what President Trump said, here's what the experts say, and they quoted these experts who had written, particularly been involved in the February Lancet letter and the March uh, Nature Medicines paper. And that became the consensus. It was a consensus in the media. It was a consensus uh, in scientific journals. And certainly um, in our conversations with what became known as the Paris Group, even though uh, we made a, a, a conscious decision not to be officially a group and not to have a name. Um, <clears throat> but there was this frustration because so many people, highly respected academics, had been sending in papers to scientific journals, all of which had been rejected because there was this brick wall of a fake consensus um, that was very, very largely enforced by both the media and the, uh, and the scientific journals. So now let me go back to the beginning of last year in, in 2020, <clears throat> because at that time, there were some pretty courageous people who started raising questions. Uh, and, and with me, I was happy to do it. The stakes for me were not huge in the sense that I, I was very well aware I was risking my relationship with the World Health Organization. Um, my Democratic friends were highly critical of me for supporting Trump, but it's not, I mean, that wasn't an existential threat uh, to me. But Scott Morrison, the Prime Minister of Australia, was incredibly courageous in early last year um, when he called for a full investigation into the origins of the pandemic in China. The Chinese government immediately cracked down. They severely and immediately restricted uh, Australian exports to China. They brutally attacked Scott, uh, Scott Morrison publicly, and what they were trying to do was essentially, and pardon me for my foul language, is beat the shit out of Australia to send an example to everybody else. If you even ask these questions, you will be punished. And so if you're gonna go there, know what you're, you're, what you're going to get. Scott Morrison had the courage of pushing forward. 
And he brought this idea to the World Health Assembly, which is the governing body made up of states, mostly ministers, ministers of health, um, last year in May 2020. This proposal to have a full investigation into pandemic origins. But what happened at the World Health Assembly was that idea, that proposal, was co-opted in a process supported by the Chinese, and I'm sorry to say, assisted um, by the, the Europeans. Um, and so the idea for a full investigation into the origins of the pandemic morphed into the, into the resolution that was actually passed, which was essentially a Chinese-controlled joint study, not an investigation, a joint study, into not the origins of the pandemic, but what was technically, technically called the zoonotic origins of the virus, meaning they were a Chinese-controlled joint study into the single hypothesis of natural origins not connected with a lab incident. It was a major, major coup that I, I don't think people fully appreciated because in the media it was reported, oh, an investigation um, has been authorized. And then the terms of reference were negotiated between the WHO and China, which were even more restrictive because the WHO thought, well, the order that they had been given was to, to examine, to study this one hypothesis. And they selected a team knowing that China had been granted veto power over who got to be a member of this um, international study group. So, um, so I was hugely, and there were a number of us, uh, our friend Gilles Demanouf uh, did a, a really great document, which is on my website and elsewhere, going through the terms of reference with an analysis of all of the compromises uh, that were made and that was standard procedure for the World Health Organization because they're not used to operating in this kind of host hostile, manipulative environment. They're used to going and trying to achieve something where um, the, the government that they're working with wants that thing to be achieved. They want polio to be eradicated or, or whatever that, that thing is. But here it was very, very different. So I was a big critic, uh, and then we had this international team uh, in the beginning of this year go to Wuhan. We all saw the images on the television. They were there for four weeks, two weeks in quarantine. So um, two weeks, and we saw the pictures of them going around on buses. Um, all we needed to know happened on the first day because they took them uh, in Wuhan. There was an ex a Chinese um, government propaganda exhibition about the glorious victory over the pandemic, um, extolling Xi Jinping. That was where they went on one of their first visits. I guarantee you that was not on the top of their list. And, but the message, the symbolic message was, we're gonna take you where we wanna take you. Um, it was not an investigation. It was a fully chaperoned, totally controlled, completely manipulated study tour. Um, and at the, so that was outrage enough. The media was calling it an, an investigation. It wasn't an investigation. They weren't calling it, they, they weren't saying, no, this is not an investigation. People were saying it was a WHO investigation. It wasn't the WHO. This was an independent advisory committee. Um, it was organized by the WHO, but the, the technical thing was it was independent advisory committee. Um, with their uh, Chinese government-affiliated uh, counterparts. And then they came out on February 9, I remember well watching this, um, with, their, um, with their press event in Wuhan, and Peter ben Mbarak, who was the head of the international study team, um, said that a lab incident origin was extremely unlikely, was their finding, and did not merit further investigation. And I remember being absolutely appalled. And so exactly then, uh, I sent a note um, to Dr. Tedros, who I greatly admire, uh, and I, a private note, and, and I said, this, it, it looks very much um, like this international group is essentially supporting the Chinese propaganda line. This will break the World Health Organization. Okay. What? Okay, sorry, sorry. Uh, I, I get animated. Um, this will break the World Health Organization if the WHO isn't 
um, on record saying we, we call for a full uh, investigation. I'm, I'm sure that others may have reached out uh, to him as well. And to his credit, uh, Tedros, three times since then, said very publicly, no, we need a full investigation of all hypotheses. We need access uh, to the raw data, um, <clears throat> and uh, we need to have a, an audit of all the Wuhan labs. When Dr. Tedros has said those things, uh, China has viciously attacked him uh, publicly and, and, and in other ways. So that's where, where things are with that. And then it came out later that Peter Ben and Barak, he did a media, a, an interview on Danish television where he admitted that when he said a lab origin, that their finding was a lab or that a lab origin was extremely unlikely and shouldn't be investigated, he was lying that his actual view was at least some aspects of a lab origin were likely, and that they needed to do an investigation. Um, but the Chinese had demanded that to have a, even a, re a report, that he had to say those things. So in a backroom horse trade, he agreed to say things that were a lie. And then we've, re we've learned um, that in March of 2018, uh, there was an application by Peter Dayzak's organization, EcoHealth Alliance, with the Wuhan Institute of Virology and the University of North Carolina and others to DARPA, uh, the, the US, uh, part of the US Defense Department, for funding to genetically engineer SARS um, coronaviruses to insert receptor binding no domains in furin cleavage sites able to infect human cells. Lo and behold, a year and a half later, the exact same kind of virus shows up in Wuhan. It's as if I apply to, uh, to you for funding to paint Pont Neuf purple, and a year later, and you, you reject the, the funding application, which is what DARPA did, but a year later, you wake up and Pont Neuf has been painted purple. You'd say, well, maybe I did it. It's at least a, a, first, a first question. So where we are now, and then I'll, I'll hand it over to, to Virginie, and I'm sorry for, uh, for going long. Where we are now <clears throat> is that uh, Tedros has called for a next phase of this joint study with full access to raw data and a full, added, uh, a full audit of the Wuhan labs. Um, China has basically told the World Health Organization and Tedros and the world to go to hell. Uh, they're not going to allow it. Uh, President Biden authorized the 90-day, initial 90-day review, which was inconclusive. Um, but to this day, there has been no international investigation into the origins of the pandemic, and none is currently planned. So what do we need to do going from here? In my view, I'll say on a national level, uh, but in the United States, I think we need to continue the Biden review process with the uh, intelligence community and, and more broadly diplomatic community indefinitely uh, to keep digging. I believe that we need in the United States a bipartisan national COVID commission looking all, at all of, our, all of the failures, including origins, and I think the same thing uh, should happen on a European level and even on a national level, in, in, at least in bigger countries like France. Internationally, um, we need to fully support uh, Tedros's call for a phase two of the study uh, process with full access to um, raw data uh, and full audit of the Wuhan labs, knowing, however, uh, that China will block it. Uh, China has made abundantly clear that they have every intention of blocking that investigation. And, and frankly, I think that the Chinese military acti activity uh, in the Taiwan Strait and around Taiwan is connected to that. I mean, it's just a guess, but connected to making clear, if you push us here, there are a lot of ways that we can respond asymmetrically. Um, but because China is not going to allow this World Health Organization process to go forward, uh, we also need a parallel international process um, that, that is not subject to a Chinese veto. And that's why I've called for uh, a process either involving the G7, OECD, the Quad, or some other grouping of countries. This can't be a US versus China issue. This must be, uh, mu this must be internationalized. And yes, it will be much more difficult to get to, the, get to the, the final answer without Chinese cooperation, but it's not impossible. 
Uh, we can't declare failure before we have even tried. And one thing which is absolutely clear to me is that we cannot give any country, including China, a veto over whether or not we investigate the worst pandemic in a century. Because if we do, even because it's easier to do so now, we'll be back here five years, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, and we'll be saying that this disaster, that's way worse than this one, could have been prevented, and it wasn't prevented because we didn't have the courage to do so. So thank you so much, and now my friend Virginie. Thank you. So I will uh, try to be fast. So it was good, I mean, for you to see the point of view of uh, Jamie, I mean, as an American and uh, as a point of view of, uh, I mean, looking at politics. So now I will give my point of view as a scientist and uh, living in France, which uh, make uh, also a difference a bit. <laughs> so I w first would like to say that we still don't know, I mean, what is the origin of the virus. So it could be a lab-related uh, accident. And uh, there are many possible scenarios. So one of them could be a researcher going to a cave where there are bats and being infected and then uh, going back to Wuhan. And you can see that this scenario is very similar to a tourist visiting a bat cave and being infected. And so there are many possibilities with a lab-related uh, accident and uh, it may be uh, very difficult to find out. So you can also imagine a man genetic manipulation of the virus, but it doesn't have to be. It could also be manipulation of a natural virus collected somewhere, and uh, that would be enough, I mean, to be connected to, to research. So why is it important to find out uh, the origin of the virus as a scientist? First, because of all the people who died and all their family, I mean, it's really important to know uh, how this all happened, and also for future generations, because we, of course, don't want uh, SARS-3 uh, coming in a few years, so it's good to really, uh, I mean, know as much as we can on, on the origin. And why as scientists? Because we are the ones who have the tools to analyze uh, virus sequences and also to look at all the data, animal and uh, patient data, and make sense of all this data to really come to conclusion. And also, you know, what, one point which is important for me is to show that it is not possible in case there was a lab accident to hide such a lab accident for many years. In case uh, there is another lab accident uh, somewhere else, people will maybe feel more to talk about it and uh, to, to reveal that there was a lab accident. And also as a scientist, it's a big puzzle. It's maybe one of the biggest questions of the century, so it's very exciting and it brings many fields together. So once we are into it, it's like we can never stop. I mean, <laughs> And uh, so this is also uh, an important point. But on the other side, there are many scientists who do not express uh, interest for a full investigation, and they don't want to investigate whether there was a, a lab accident. So why is that? So one re main reason, I would say that from the beginning, and especially with the Lancet uh, article which was published in February uh, 2020, it was seen as a conspiracy theory, which means, uh, I mean, it's really uh, so complicated to imagine a lab accident. Uh, let's not believe it. And it was also seen as a racist and as saying, like, oh, the Chinese, they don't know what they're doing. And so this made a lot of people not uh, go into this direction. And uh, there was also another critique, which was uh, all these people who argue that we should investigate a lab leak, they always ask questions, they are not practical, and they don't focus on... Uh, the future, they are going backwards, and uh, it's not good. And this I feel really strange, because as scientists, we always ask questions. That's our role, and we ask, we ask, until uh, we find conclusion on which uh, we, we think we are good. So I really don't understand uh, this critique, but it has been made and, uh, in Nature journals and other uh, journals. Then uh, another critique was it's better to work on the current uh, COVID crisis. I mean, we need to find uh, drugs or treatment and see how to prevent uh, uh, contamination, so this I agree, but still we are a lot of uh, biologists and a lot of uh, people, so some can work on this question and others can work on the origin, it doesn't make sense to all focus on one question. Then uh, there is also the fear that it could be a lab accident and all the consequences of it. A lot of people are scared that it would increase uh, regulation in, uh, for the labs, 
so they prefer not to go into the, that direction. So this is, a, I agree, uh, I mean, uh, uh, it could be a negative consequence, but in case there is something, the regulation which needs to be changed are very specific and very focused on a highly pathogen uh, species, and not on, for example, I work on Drosophila flies, I don't think it matters. So there are still uh, huge parts of biology which shouldn't be affected uh, by, uh, by the conclusion. Then there is also the reason that it's too political and people don't want, I mean, especially uh, researchers, they don't want to be on the Trump side on a right-wing uh, politics, so they don't want to go into this direction. Another reason also in the scientific world is that there are many powerful uh, scientists which, who from the beginning uh, uh, dismissed uh, the lab accident hypothesis, like for example uh, Jeremy Farrar, who is, uh, I mean, uh, dealing with a lot of money in the UK and uh, distributing money for biological research. And so maybe you notice, but uh, in the UK, there is nobody uh, signing our letters and doing anything. I mean, in the UK, people are really uh, not uh, arguing anything. I think here in France, uh, we are quite uh, still lucky. I mean, we are, I mean, like I am a CNRS researcher. I know that, I mean, uh, I should keep my position. I mean, unless I, something really bad happened, but, uh, I feel free and I, I'm not so dependent on uh, grants. And so that's why I, I feel I, I can uh, tell more about what I think compared to other people who are more dependent on, uh, on grants. Another reason is that also science and nature journals were heavily biased when they were talking about the origin of the pandemic since the beginning. And so researchers are really used to read uh, nature and science. And so if you read only this, and you believe uh, what, is, what they say, then uh, you think, oh yeah, it's natural, uh, no problem. And uh, also a lot of people didn't know the type of re research which was uh, being done in uh, Wuhan labs. And so usually when they just uh, trust uh, the experts, they trust uh, the WHO, and uh, they trust uh, China. This, because this is uh, what we do as scientists. I mean, we don't really uh, question what people say, and, or we wouldn't think that they would lie. I mean, it's not what we do in general. We just read our papers and we move on from there. So this is not the way we usually uh, do. So these are many reasons why a lot of scientists didn't go into it. And um, in the end, people who went into the question are mostly what we call outsiders. Like for example, myself, I mean, I work on uh, Drosophila fruit flies. I do a lot of genetics and I, do, I work on evolution. I try to reconstruct the past, but I don't work on viruses. I, I, I mean, before this pandemic, I didn't know much about uh, viral transmission and things like that. So, and many people uh, like me uh, started to, to investigate and a lot of people who are not even uh, researchers. So people who met uh, through Twitter and they created a group uh, called uh, Drastic and maybe you heard about it and they were really helpful and they found a lot of information that nobody else uh, had found. And uh, so with my uh, perspective, it's also helpful because I know how to analyze a lot of uh, genetic sequences. And my, my goal in my research is really to reconstruct the past. So usually it's the past which occurred several million years ago. So here it's more what happened in the last few years. So it's in a way simpler because we have more uh, clues and uh, it's easier to find. And also the genome of the virus is much smaller than the genome of a fruit fly. So there are uh, advantages, but at the same time, there are disadvantages because people lie, you're not sure, but it's hard to know whether we can trust the data or not. And uh, so there are many things which make it also harder. So, I mean, it's both. And um, so now if we look at the scientific literature, so the, yeah, the first uh, time that one scientist raised the hypothesis that it, was, it could be a lab accident. It was in uh, January 2020 in science, so it was really uh, in the early days. And it was from a molecular biologist, uh, Richard Ebright, and he was interviewed by Science, and it's in a science uh, paper. And he said, yes, yeah, the data are consistent with entry into the human population as either a natural accident or a laboratory accident. And so this was uh, one sentence in this paper. But then after that, uh, nothing happened, and um, it was really uh, not uh, a common uh, hypothesis to be found in uh, scientific journals. So there were a few um, people who sent articles to different journals, to Nature, to Science, Nature Medicine, uh, 
even uh, people are sometimes sending articles to bioarchive and sometimes it was even rejected on a preprint uh, journal and so there were a few researchers uh, trying to argue that we couldn't conclude uh, that it was fully natural we had to to get more data but they couldn't publish any uh, scientific papers so on my side i mean how did i come uh, interested into the question so it was i think it was in march i mean I had a phone call from a, a friend who I uh, highly respect, and he's a researcher in physics. And he told me, yeah, you know, uh, maybe it's not uh, natural. And I was like, oh, really? It's not natural? <laughs> I mean, because I was also just, uh, I mean, hearing what people say, and I, I was not really thinking about it. And as soon as he told me, I was, oh, ah, yes, I mean, actually, you're right, we, we don't know. And from this moment, I mean, to me, it was this moment, and I remember I was on the phone, I remember exactly where I was. <laughs> and from this moment, I started to look and to see that, indeed, I mean, we could not fully conclude uh, and uh, dismiss the lab accident hypothesis. And so then, uh, with him and with others in France, we started to work on it. So I had a friend working on uh, sequence evolution and really uh, digging into it. So we worked together with him and uh, other people. And so we started to have uh, regular meetings once a week. I think it was in uh, uh, August uh, 2020. And then in September, I, uh, I told them uh, it would be good if we not just stay uh, between us, like uh, five or six people. We, we should really try to make it uh, international, international because I, we could see that there were several people uh, discussing on Twitter and other things. And we couldn't uh, really uh, get our message uh, to, to say so I thought okay so it would be really good to organize something and because we are uh, scientists and we are used to organize uh, conferences and workshops so we did it as a scientist so maybe it would look a bit different but uh, for people but so we said okay uh, let's uh, invite uh, people and we will uh, just uh, present uh, I mean invite people to give talks and then uh, have a discussion I mean as we are doing uh, today but it was more like scientific data and uh, what can we find and so it started in uh, January 2020, and since then we have been uh, continuing, and so next week will be uh, the 10th tenth, uh, tenth session of the workshop. So usually there are about 30 people coming, not always the same people, but uh, that's about it. And uh, Jamie, I mean, during uh, one of the sessions we had, he pro I mean, because we were all, uh, I mean, saying between ourselves, we, we sent uh, articles to scientific journals, it's always uh, rejected. And uh, what, what can we do? And so Jamie, he had the idea to, to write open letters so to, and to then send them to, to journalists. And this was really a way which worked. And uh, to me, I was surprised because I'm a scientist. I mean, I am used to deal I mean, with scientific issues. I will talk with scientists and I will try to publish my data. But here, I could see it was not possible. And the way we, it worked for this case was to go uh, with the help of uh, the journalists to put back uh, the question of uh, the origin and uh, whether it was a virus. So it was a big, uh, uh, I mean, surprise to me, but uh, it, uh, it worked out uh, well. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah. So then what should I, so maybe I will just uh, finish. So what I discovered also uh, working on this issue is that there are a lot of uh, transparency issues. So we talk a lot about uh, problems of transparency in China. I mean, it's true, and I, I can tell a bit about it. So, for example, the database of all the virus uh, sequences that they gather at, in uh, Wuhan is still uh, not available. And uh, this database was created in case of pandemic so that people can go uh, quickly and look at the sequences and have a better idea of where the virus comes from. And here, it's like exactly the opposite. I mean. Since the pandemic, the database is closed and nobody knows uh, what's, what is in there. We don't know, uh, we don't have the raw data of the animals that were tested around Wuhan to know, I mean, if it could be uh, possible that it was transmitted through an animal. We don't have any data on retrospective uh, tracing, like the early patients, who, who did they contact, uh, what did they do uh, previously before they, they uh, developed the disease. We don't know anything about that. We know that there are a lot of asymptomatic people and we don't know about uh, the contacts they had which were, could be asymptomatic. We know, I mean, we hear from uh, America that there were sick uh, patients from the Wuhan Institute of Virology, but is it true? I mean, uh, what can we learn more about it? We don't know also uh, the lab uh, books of uh, the Institute of Virology, they are not, uh, we don't know what they were working on exactly when the pandemic started. We don't know much also about uh, the 
pneumonia which uh, started in uh, 2012 in a cave where one of the closely related virus of SARS-CoV-2 uh, had been found. There are also problems about this uh, virus which is closely related and which was identified by the Wuhan Institute of Virology and we, we don't know. The access to this mine is closed also, so these are all uh, problems of transparency uh, related to China. But then there are also problems of transparency from the US, and I'm sorry, uh, Jamie, about this. <laughs> so, for example, uh, in NCBI, they host a lot of uh, sequences, and uh, usually researchers, when they publish data, they need to submit their sequences to NCBI. And so we know that at the beginning of the pandemic, I mean, some people uh, revealed that uh, the sequence of SARS-CoV-2 was submitted to NCBI, but under embargo for several days. So it was not uh, delivered to the scientific uh, community. And then after five days, uh, the Chinese researcher sent an email, it's okay, you can uh, release the data. And then NCBI released the data. But this, there was no, uh, I mean, we heard about it by people who leaked uh, documents, but NCBI did never talk about it. So we know that there were also uh, sequences from the early patients at the beginning of the pandemic in December or January, which were submitted to NCBI and then removed. So the part of the data was uh, found again, but uh, another set of data, we don't know, and uh, some uh, researchers asked NCBI and they, they didn't reply. We don't know all also about the projects which were uh, submitted uh, uh, in collaboration with the US, uh, with the Wuhan, and uh, it would be really nice to know more about it and also their project reports to see what they were exactly doing. And um, there are also issues of transparency with uh, the UK. And uh, so, for example, uh, there were several uh, researchers uh, in the UK who organized a meeting in the early days of the pandemic. And uh, maybe you've seen uh, I mean the, on the newspapers. So we know that they emailed each other. Uh, but all the emails are redacted. We don't see anything. Everything is black. And uh, this is very curious. I mean, they discussed about whether there was a lab accident in the early days, in January and February. Then they concluded it was uh, natural, but we cannot see what they discussed. Uh, it feels really strange. They just said, this is a scientific method. Okay, I mean, if it's scientific method, just uh, show us what were your arguments and how you conclude. And uh, to me, it doesn't make uh, sense. <laughs> so these are all problems. I'm not sure uh, we will uh, solve them, but uh, I mean, I will try to, to continue and <laughs> do what I can to, to make it advance further. So thank you for your attention. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you so much for both of you. It was um, absolutely fascinating, I must say. <laughs> very scary, very yeah, scary. Yeah, yeah. Aren't you scared, mm. physically? No, I mean, yeah, I'm not. Okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, we, we have a time for a Q&A. Uh, des questions en français ou en anglais. Uh, si Jamie ne comprend pas la question en français, mais probablement. Monsieur, allez-y. Alors, euh, je, vais, euh, je, vais prendre, euh, je vais vous donner le, le micro de manière que votre question soit enregistrée, d'accord Et présente, euh, présentez-vous juste. Donc, Emmanuel Ferrand de Sorbonne Université. Je, fais, euh, je suis extérieur au champ des... De, de la biologie, j'ai une question technique sur le, la, la présence du virus qui est reporté euh, d'après la, la presse, hein, disons, avant euh, le début de l'épidémie officielle. Et comment ça s'inscrit dans votre histoire uh, yeah. So the question is, uh, I mean, we know that the virus, I mean, the first patients are from December 2019. Okay, I mean, the, I mean, the ones which are officially uh, recognized. I mean, yeah in Wuhan, and so people have tried to see whether we can uh, go back in time and find uh, patients which were infected earlier. So you mean in other countries, you mean? Yeah, yeah. So there were several studies, and uh, so one possibility is to look at uh, waste water, and you look for uh, traces of RNA. So the problem is that in waste water, you find very small amounts, and so it's never completely uh, possible to exclude uh, contamination. So all these cases on uh, waste water are indications, but they are not definitive proof. So these ones, we can never be sure. So that's a problem uh, with the uh, wastewater data. So then there are data about uh, blood samples where people found antibodies which can recognize uh, SARS-CoV-2. And this was found in uh, many countries, in Italy, in uh, the US, in France. 
But also these cases, it's not uh, definitive proof because it could be a former infection to another coronavirus which is closely related. And so it's not also a definitive proof. So the only cases for which uh, we can be sure are cases for which we find RNA of the virus and we sequence it and it's really the sequence of uh, SARS-CoV-2 or very, I mean, uh, with one or two mutations compared to the one sequence in uh, December. And uh, there are a few studies, but each of them, so far, there is no uh, consensus on the scientific community. So one case was uh, in France in uh, December, but also it's a small uh, piece and uh, they, are not, they couldn't sequence it, so it's not uh, sure. Then in Italy, there are several studies, but uh, we discussed, I mean, at our workshop, uh, we invited them and we discussed a lot, but uh, personally, I wouldn't uh, conclude completely. So they had uh, more than 10 cases from uh, before December, but still, uh, it could be a contamination with a positive control. So, yeah, nothing uh, completely sure. But it's really important to go more into this. So, at least in France, we have a I mean, collaboration with several uh, physicians who collected uh, samples from patients and uh, not, uh, I mean, sometimes they didn't have uh, the disease, but something else. And we, with them, we are collaborating to uh, sequence them and see whether we can find uh, earlier traces. And I think this should be really done in many countries. So, but uh, so far, not so much. Yeah, and I would just <coughs> add that, in my view, the most important thing, but not the only important thing, is to seek as patient zero or as close to patient zero as possible in Wuhan. And that is exactly what the Chinese government is preventing. And so there are all of these, these questions, <clears throat> but the core, and that's what it had the raw data that they didn't allow the independent uh, team, the WHO convened team, access to. And, and so again, Virginie talked about scientific arguments versus just logical arguments or even legal arguments. So it's a scientific argument that we don't have this data. It's a logical argument, well, if the Chinese government is doing everything possible to prevent access to exactly this data, what are the implications? Yeah, uh, maybe uh, I can just uh, finish. Uh, I mean, uh, we know that uh, in China they have a very good way to uh, do a retrospective tracing. I mean, there are very beautiful papers from the beginning of the pandemic, like somebody was contaminated in an elevator. I mean, they could really see when the person took the elevator. It was three minutes after the one who was contaminated. I mean, it's really beautiful studies, and there are many uh, very nice studies uh, made by uh, Japan, by sorry, by uh, by China, and also many uh, other uh, countries in Asia. So. We know they, they can do a lot, and here in the WHO report, there is uh, not much. Uh, yeah. So there, there are a bunch of questions. I have to go more or less in order. So this gentleman here, and then you, you, and you, okay? And more questions after that, but. So I'm uh, David Kossauer. I'm a physicist, and uh, I've been following this issue, among others, uh, since early last year. I have a question for Jamie, and uh, you spoke about not wanting to point fingers. I'm very sympathetic to that. But I think one has to distinguish the accident from the cover-up that happened afterwards. And it's not just a Chinese cover-up. There was a participation of a lot of Western scientists, science journalists, and editors of leading journals like Nature, Lancet, Science. And uh, the question is, what do you see in terms of accountability for these people for their roles in an eventual cover-up? Yeah, uh, great question, David, thank you. So, yeah, so my view is we should point fingers, we must point fingers, it just should be done fairly and, and based on the available evidence. Um, <clears throat> and so the first answer in my mind is we need to dig fearlessly to figure out to the best of our abilities what happened. Already, though, it's, it's pretty clear that many individuals, newspapers, scientific journals, governments, um, didn't behave as we would have liked them to do. And, and that's why we need to have processes for, uh, for accountability. I certainly think uh, that on, on every level, uh, for organizations like EcoHealth Alliance, 
Um, Virginie and I were signatories of a letter that was sent a couple of that we sent a couple of weeks ago, uh, calling for the board of EcoHealth Alliance uh, to investigate Peter Dayzak and um, we think most likely remove him from his uh, position. Uh, we certainly feel that in scientific journals um, there should be internal investigations. Did they do the right thing? And again, I I don't impute anybody's. Um, motives. Um, we all have our, our biases, and if we put ourselves back into the mindset of last year, a lot of people were afraid. Um, there was a, a lot of, uh, of hatred and, and racial animus, and a lot of things were, were woven in. But that's why we have to do these kinds of investigations. I've mentioned uh, for in the United States why I think we need to have <coughs> a national, <coughs> excuse me, a national COVID-19 uh, commission. Um, because if we don't identify what went wrong and hold ourselves and other people accountable and fix it, um, we'll have the same, uh, the same problems next time. So I just think that we, we just need to be fearless, um, uh, not necessarily vindictive. Um, and then to your point or reference to, to my point about the cover-up, there's two questions. Um, one is origins. Uh, and even if, if I had to say, well, what's the hypothesis of a, uh, of a lab incident uh, origin? And, and if I, let's just say I thought, well, what's the most, the likely version of the lab incident hypothesis? I would say it's, it's this, um, that they had um, SARS-1. After SARS-1, the world recognized we need greater capacity to understand the threat and respond to it. Uh, and so we decentralized capacity, and that was why the French government and the American government supported these kinds of efforts around the world in Wuhan. Um, I think that then the, uh, the, there was a massive collection process um, by Wuhan Institute, Institute of Virology and others. And if I had to guess, and this is purely a guess, um, there was the public part of that and the private part of that. And the public part of that was Shu Zheng Li. And the private part of that probably was something involving the Chinese People's Liberation Army. And they both cohabitated in the same place. And there were some things where being public and open was a more useful approach. And there were other areas where being private and secretive was a more, a, a more beneficial approach from the Chinese perspective. And there was a cohabitation. And then, again, purely hypothesis, um, in, the, um, uh, in the process, not of creating a bioweapon, um, but of trying to develop uh, vaccines and treatments, but in a secret way, there was an accident. And the local, and when you have this kind of accident, you don't know what's happened. I mean, it takes a lot of sleuthing. And so the instinct of the local officials was, well, we're just going to cover it up. And, and lot, there have been lots of outbreaks that have just gone away just naturally. And we think that'll probably happen, so we're going to, uh, to cover it up. And then a few weeks later, the national government realizes what's happened and steps in, and then they have a choice. If they, the message is, well, there was probably an accident here, the local people probably covered it up, uh, and we're declaring this new principle for Chinese governance on the local level. It's full transparency and accountability. So if you're covering up something bad, now is your time to come clean. Well, then it's the Prague Spring in, in China, and the government falls two weeks later. And so they had an existential choice, purely hypo I mean, I'm also a novelist, so take this with a grain of salt. Um, there, there is an existential choice. Are we all in with the cover-up or all in, the, in, in with transparency? And so I think that there were two things. One was, let's not dig, because if we dig, we may find more information <laughs> that would be bad for us. I think that's when they said, let's just go with the cover-up. It's a hypothesis. Okay, say that again yeah. and introduce yourself. Yes, uh, yeah. I'm, uh, my name is Daniel Korkos, uh, and uh, I have some problems also with cover-ups. Yeah. And uh, I believe that it's uh, an accident. And what is very surprising is the cover-up, not from China. It's obvious that they will uh, try to do everything they can to avoid 
any uh, problems, but the cover-up from the US. Why this cover-up and what are the relationship of this uh, project with the military industrial uh, complex from the USA? So, so I don't know about the military industrial complex, but yeah, I certainly- bioweapons, bioweapons. So, so the money is directly related to, 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 to the, the, the army. So, well, so just to go back, so uh, EcoHealth Alliance got US government funding from yeah. USAID, from the Defense Department, and it was all, it, yes, and, and it was all connected to this idea that we need to study viruses around the world, that we're better doing it in the countries where those viruses are, and we need to invest in those um, capacities. I agree that the United States government hasn't been as transparent as it, as it should have been. I think it's appalling, and that's why I'm saying we need to point fingers everywhere, China, ourselves, everybody, and we need to dig fearlessly. I was appalled, as I know Virginie was, um, that it was only a month ago that this uh, DARPA diffuse application was made public. I happen to, I mean, I won't say no, but kind of know, um, that there was a decision in the Defense Department to actually leak it um, because the sense was, well, we did the right thing. We don't want to get blamed for this. But the fact that there had been this application in March of 2018, and we're only learning about it now, I mean, there are a lot of things that our group and Drastic and there's overlap um, have had to dig up that should have just been presented immediately. I, I think it's, it's appalling and, and that's why I, mean, I certainly am, I think this is, mo China has the most to answer for, but we all, including the United States, have a lot to answer for and that's we need to dig fairly and fearlessly. So what, uh, what, so what would you answer? So why was it all not said from the beginning? You know, I don't know. I mean, it, I, I don't, I don't, I mean, one is a lot of incompetence, um, bureaucratic inertia. Was there somebody who said, oh, we can't say something? I know in, in the Vanity Fair article, there was, a conver there was some conversations in the State Department um, where somebody said, oh, if we... If Yeah, no, so that's what I'm saying. There certainly was U.S. taxpayer money that went through EcoHealth Alliance to Wuhan Institute of Virology. It was around $600,000. Well, it was... Oh, no, 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 but, but I'm saying that's why we need a full investigation. That's why I'm calling for a bipartisan commission that really digs into everything. So we have at least three more questions. Okay, I'll be very short. Yeah. I'm Ursula Gauthier from LOPS, and I have a question about transparency concerning France, because it, it seems that the first um, big event for propagating the, the virus was the military games in Wuhan in November, I think, yeah. And then many uh, French military athletes came back and they were very sick with symptoms uh, like the, the COVID too. And then uh, some you know, local newspapers talked about it, and then nothing, it was buried. So why was it buried in this case? Yeah, I mean, uh, I agree and I have no answer <laughs> to you, but uh, it's the same, I mean, uh, there were, I mean, according to the Chinese, <laughs> there were five athletes uh, from uh, the US coming back who were sick also and uh, for other countries and we don't know anything about them. Yeah, I mean, that's a strange. So in our group, some people try to ask in France, but we don't have answers, so we don't know. Monsieur, uh, introduce yourself. André Klarsfeld, uh, I'm a neurobiologist. Um, first, uh, a general question about conspirationism. Um, I'm, 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 I feel very uh, troubled uh, by the fact that we are obliged in a certain way to um, uh, follow a uh, conspirationist uh, way of thinking because we are faced with a conspiracy. I mean, there is a conspiracy. Uh, but in a certain way, uh, the fact that we are obliged to deal with it 
uh, only brings more water to the mill, to the conspirationist mill, the general conspirationist mill that is so uh, dangerous for our societies. So that's a general comment. I mean, I don't know how you feel about it, but uh, you know, there's a saying that <clears throat> uh, you would be a paranoid if everybody was against you, you know. Uh, <laughs> and I mean, it's sort of that kind of situation. Uh, then a more uh, uh, specific question about the implication of the French government in the Wuhan Institute of Biology. I, I understand that they had, I don't know if it was the INSERM of the CNRS, <clears throat> but they had an arrangement, an agreement uh, to be for cooperation between France and, and China. And the Chinese, as soon as the institute opened, just threw them away. Uh, so is is that so? Is it is, is that true? And 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 why didn't the, the French government insist more on accountability at that at that moment? I mean, they should have de uh, denounced that. Yeah, I mean, I just uh, read newspapers or books about it, and I don't know much besides that, so I, I can't really answer. I mean, about the P4 lab. Uh, yeah. So for the conspiracy uh, theory, I mean, they add uh, two words, yeah, theory and conspiracy, to make it look like it's invalid and like it's a theory. So to me, I mean, conspiracy has a very strict meaning. It means a secret plan by a group to do something uh, harmful or unlawful, but in the future. So well, then there is a conspiracy of silence. Yeah, so conspiracy, I mean, this is a strict definition, but then what I would say is there is a cover-up. So cover-up, for sure but not a conspiracy in the sense that it's not to plan to do something harmful in the future. It's just maybe there was a lab accident and maybe even some people they cover up, not because they know it's a lab accident, just because they don't want people to investigate. So it's a cover up, maybe that they, some, they don't even know, so you know. cover up can have long term consequences. Yeah, 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 yeah. So for sure we know there is a cover up because there are, I mean, as I said, I mean, there are a lot of things we ask and we know that people have the information and we don't uh, have the information. So, and it's mostly, uh, I mean, China, US, UK, and France also. I mean, there are, as you said, I mean, the athletes, I mean, there are still things people are asking and we don't know. And uh, then it makes it, uh, yeah, we become a bit uh, paranoid. I mean, because then who can we believe? And uh, if everything uh, can be a lie, what do we believe? So. I find it very difficult. I mean, that's what I find most difficult compared to my research in Drosophila, where all the researchers, we all talk to each other, we all talk about our results, and uh, we go from there. So here, it's much more difficult. But no, 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 excuse me. We have no choice, that's how question. we have to continue. Yeah. Uh, and just, just very quickly on, on your two points. First, um, I agree with you that when the French got kicked out, it was a moment, and France should have done more to speak publicly. Uh, French intelligence did privately approach U.S. intelligence and say, we're really um, concerned about that. And that was when the U.S. Um, State Department sent its team to the Wuhan Institute of Virology. It was connected to that uh, messaging that the French had delivered. And then, I totally agree with your, your point, uh, is that the world is full of all these accusations of conspiracy. And I find it with myself, like I'm, I, I actually think, as you know, there's a lot of major um, questions, whether it's called a conspiracy cover-up, whatever, uh, big problems here. And so I'm on now, just through this, have become quite active on Twitter and, and get a lot of positive reinforcement. But then I have other issues that I care about. And, and so when I post, which I do all the time, about how I'm fully supportive of vaccines and it's critically important, that I find that these people saying, like, we love you, we thought you were on our side, how can you be supporting vaccines? So there's a whole kind yeah. of ecosystem, and even with drastic, like I, I think drastic here, these kind of, I mean, they're called internet sleuths, some of them are, are internet sleuths, and some of them are, are professors, one. yeah, <laughs> yeah, um, and yeah, yeah, um, but then I was, was watching um, on CNN, I was in the gym a couple of weeks ago, and I was, there was a, a, a documentary about Britney Spears, uh, the 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 uh, singer. singer and and it was about how Britney Spears and she had this thing where um, her father had control of her career and then there were these internet sleuths and they went in and they got all this data and it was it started the free Britney movement and they were the ones who dug up everything that led last week to the her legal status being changed and you realize 
that we're at this kind of moment um, where lots of things are being decentralized. Voice is being decentralized. Ability to gather information is being decentralized. And it's a double-edged sword um, where you can do a lot of great things and, and regular people can achieve things that would have in the past not been possible. But how do you avoid being in a world where everybody, some group distrusts everything and it's kind of this, this post-truth world, which is, you know, I know we're in the home of, um, of uh, Derrida and Foucault and whatever, but it's kind of a scary world that I certainly wouldn't want to live in. <laughs> Let me reassure you, Derrida was never a member of our academy. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we're sort of running out of time. Jacques Serre has a question now, and if there's yet another question, not... Um, you, you want to... Je suis journaliste à Radio France Internationale et je travaille à la rédaction chinoise. Juste pour compléter, la, vous parlez de la collaboration entre la France et la Chine. Au moment de... Euh, nous avons l'impression, quand, quand il y a eu l'épidémie, quand, quand, au moment du commencement de l'épidémie, euh, on est focalisé sur la, le P4. Donc la France était clairement montrée du doigt du moins dans le monde sinophone, et nous avons quand même l'impression que la diplomatie française essaie de dire que ce n'est pas nous, c'est eux, c'est les Américains. Nous, nous, nous avons effectivement construit le laboratoire, après on n'a plus rien à faire, c'est eux. Donc, alors qu'on sait qu'au moment de l'épidémie, il y avait encore un chercheur français qui était sur place, un, 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 un professeur de, de Lille qui était sur place. Donc, on ne sait pas trop ce que ça veut dire que nous n'avons plus de relations entre, avec la Chine. Et exactement comme maintenant, euh, les, les Chinois, par exemple, l'ambassadeur chinois récemment dans une interview, en parlant de, justement, le, la recherche de gain of function à l'oratoire de Wuhan, il dit que nous, de toute façon, les Chinois, nous, on n'a pas la technologie. C'est les Américains, c'est Ravel Baric, c'est eux qui nous ont donné. C'est-à-dire que si même si on, ainsi un jour on a découvert que l'épidémie est effectivement à raison des recherches de gain de fonction et ensuite il y a une fille de laboratoire, eh bien la responsable ce n'est pas nous, c'est les Américains. C'est ça le discours en fait. Merci. Donc une, une, une dernière question. Euh... Okay, my name is Jack Serres, and I'm a retired engineer. I've been working in China, uh, setting up factory in Shanghai for telecommunications 30 years ago. That's a long time. Uh, okay, you almost replied to all the questions I had before uh, before being here. Um, on one on one hand, uh, as a human being, you look for trust. On the other side, the China is a big country that wants to create a new order in the worldwide. So my question is simple. Um, will this step of a virus help China progressing or not? As yeah. you have a good big yeah. experience thank you, with thank China's you for, part. Thank you for asking. And as a matter of fact, I did a, um, a two hour interview on this exact topic with Ursula two days ago. So I'll give you my quick answer here and then you can read next week in Lubbs. Um, the, uh, the, uh, our interview. Um, so l let me place that in a larger context. I think right now uh, there's a change in perception of China in many parts of the world. I think in the United States it's the case and I believe it's starting to happen in, in Europe. Uh, when um, the United States took the lead in uh, welcoming China into the World Trade uh, Organization uh, in the 90s, um, there was an idea that by opening up and by integrating China into the rules-based international order, uh, that that order would change, but China would adapt and over time uh, become uh, what has been called a responsible stakeholder. Now there's a shift. Uh, I think that um, it's a bipartisan belief in the United States, a dominant belief um, that China doesn't have that intention, that the Chinese leaders, that maybe past Chinese leaders like Xu Rongji had that intention, that the current crop of leaders do not. 
this perception is it's not like the Soviet Union where they want to break the system, um, but it's more like learning from the virus. Why is the virus so effective is um, that it has decided, well, what is the right level of intervention so that it can capitalize on the behavior of the host? And so in the perception of Chinese engagement with international organizations and in international uh, uh, bodies, um, the idea is that China is trying to co-opt those bodies. And so we see that in the World Health Organization, where I think that's the effort. I think Tedros is trying to find that, that balance, but that's why, in my view, the WHO, it took a while for the WHO to get its footing in the beginning because it had been so compromised. Um, we see that in the United Nations, we, we see that ar around the world. And so with the, um, uh, the pandemic, um, certainly it's just objectively the case so far that China is in a stronger relative position now than it was in the beginning. Um, I don't think, I, I've always said, I don't think this was a deliberate act by the, the, uh, the, the pandemic was a deliberate act by the Chinese. But I do think that they have very smartly and strategically capitalized on what's happened. And I think it's very unfortunate. <clears throat> so it's time to break up, to close the session. Merci beaucoup à nos orateurs. Merci particulièrement à Virginie, parce qu'on est très content d'avoir Jamie, mais on a Jamie grâce à Virginie. Yeah. Et donc, merci à vous deux. C'était vraiment passionnant. Et je suis sûr qu'il y aura des suites. Il y a le... Donc, vous pouvez contacter l'un ou l'autre des orateurs. Jamie a ce, ce, ce site web très actif, mm -hmm. euh, plein d'informations. Et donc, je pense que c'est le début euh, d'une longue histoire. Merci beaucoup. Merci à tous. Merci. merci.